Good luck. All right. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Snack Break Podcast by Ortho Snacks. I'm your host, John Schaefer, and on this podcast, I interview physical therapists, fitness professionals, and health and wellness experts. My guest today is someone I've been following for a little bit over a year now. She's a 2022 graduate of the University of Scranton, where she played field hockey for four years. She's a host of the Goal Set Mindset Podcast, a weekly show dedicated to bringing the latest in fitness, wellness, and mindset advice to listeners in an easily digestible format. She's currently a PT and strength conditioning specialist at True Sports Physical Therapy in Maryland, and she's a champion of gratitude, practicing and sharing her morning reflections for the last 930 days. She is Julie Burrell. Julie, welcome to the show. John, thank you so much for having me. I'm pumped to be here. Yeah, so I'm really excited to chat today because I think we've got a lot of overlap in our journeys. Um, we both graduated in 2022. Um, we're both fairly active on social media and have been through this journey of trying to get a podcast started and meet other individuals within the field. Um, and this is an area where you've got a little bit more experience than me, but I'm also working towards it. And that is the practice of gratitude. So you've been going at this gratitude practice for 900 days now. So we'll chat a little bit about that too. Yeah, definitely. Um, so excited. Yeah. So I want to start the conversation. Just having graduated in 2022, what's that transition been like so far? Maybe tell me a little bit um, about where you're working now, some of the challenges you're facing. Yeah, what's been going definitely. Well? I think the word transition is the best way to describe it. Um, so like yourself, I finished school in May of 2022 throughout the summer, studied for boards, passed boards in July, um, and then started working September 1st. So I'm, as we're recording this, I just hit my three month mark as a practicing physical nice. therapist. And man, I cannot even begin to describe um, how much I've learned and how much I've learned about more things I need to learn <laughs> over the last mm -hmm. three months. But it's been awesome. Uh, working for True Sports is really cool. It's definitely um, exactly where I wanted to be as a new grad. I get to work with athletes and an active population um, inside of a gym setting. So one of the blessings of my job is I am one-on-one -on -one with all of my patients and mm -hmm. really have the, the facilities um, to be able to blend my love for strength and conditioning with physical therapy. So that's been really awesome. Um, and outside of that, big transition for me is I also moved to an entirely new state and unfamiliar state um, to start my life as a PT. So I'm from New York, just outside of New York City in Rockland County, mm -hmm. went to school in Scranton, Pennsylvania, traveled around a bit for my clinicals, explored the East Coast, and ultimately landed just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, which if you told me six months ago, John, that I was going to be living in Maryland, I'd be like, why? Really? Like, so really learning to embrace the unknown, taking opportunities, um, that appear, you know, even those that are unexpected. And in terms of clinical practice, a big part of the transition has definitely been um, leaning on mentors. You know, one of the things that I think is tricky for new grads is finding mentorship. And we're always mm -hmm. told in school, make sure you ask about this in your job and make sure there's a rigid mentorship program. And I will say, I do have mentorship at my job um, that is definitely very helpful, but I also think it's it's on us as clinicians to seek out mentorship from people who are in positions that we want to be in or have been through what we've been through. So you mentioned social media and off the mic, we spoke a bit about how much we love to connect with our profession through this lens. So I have a few mentors in my life who I've only met in person like once, some of them not at all. And they are serving as mentors for me clinically, um, just as much as the people who I'm actually working with. So that's the biggest thing I've been thinking about is just like, where can I learn from and how can I get information from all these different avenues and apply it to my own craft? Yeah, I think that that's one of the things that's probably been the most powerful me, for me to realize in these last couple months is even if you don't necessarily have mentors surrounding you in person, there's just so many resources online nowadays. A lot of top physical therapists now have their own podcasts and making YouTube content. So even if you are in a situation where maybe you're not getting the mentorship that you're looking for, that's not necessarily the 
you know, be all end all. You can still reach out online. A lot of people have like monthly subscriptions too, where you can participate in discords and things like that. So don't limit yourself to what's around you if it's not necessarily what you want to see in the moment. But I think I really liked what you said about just this period of being a transition. I know for me, my first probably week and a half to two weeks, I was just like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. Um, because for the first time, you don't really have anyone over your shoulder checking you know, your documentation um, before you hit submit. It's kind of all on you. But what I've realized is I just had my 90 day review too. After you get to you know four or five weeks in, things just start to seem a little bit more natural, which is cool. Now it's kind of at a point where I don't think about it quite as much. You just go in, you do the job, um, you're able to clinically reason a little bit more. Um, sure, you don't have all the answers, but at the same time, you know, you know you're not necessarily going to cause a patient any harm. It might be a situation um, where you could do things differently to get them better faster. But again, we're kind of on a problem solving stage, which I think is an okay place to be. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, like you mentioned, like time is the most important thing, like just having patience with ourselves. And when I look back to those first few weeks as a clinician as well, um, I'm proud of the things that I've learned and the things that I'm doing better. And it's, I think it's important to look back on that short term growth um, to just kind of feel settled in, in this process of like, okay, I am learning these things as I go. Um, And then just not being afraid to ask questions. Like another thing I've realized is, is having that humility um, to know when it's appropriate to ask a question or say to your patient, like, Hey, I just want to grab one of the other PTs and have him come check this out too. Like, I want to see his thoughts. And like, when I first started doing that or thought about doing that, I was so nervous because, you know, we're taught, we're taught in school a lot of times, like fake it till you make it, make sure your patient knows that you're confident And I totally agree with being confident. Like you you can't look like a deer in headlights, but I've also learned that nine times out of 10 patients will be like, oh yeah, cool. Have them look at it too. Like they don't give it a second thought and think that you're incapable just because it's like, oh, I haven't felt, you know, a fully torn ACL before. Like, let me have somebody else confirm this. Mm -hmm. Um, Situations like that have, have taught me a lot. I think a lot of times the patients too just appreciate the fact that you recognize um, that you're maybe not 100% sure on this and that you do want to get a second opinion to make sure that they're getting the best care possible. So I think that's powerful as well. I want to talk just a little bit about the actual setup at True Sport. Um, So my understanding is that it's a nice blend of both PT and strength conditioning. I worked at um, Champion PT and performance over the summer as a strength coach out in Boston. And I think it was a little bit of a similar model, but so is there actually, there's personal training sessions and then there's physical therapy. Is there like a continuum of care where you see a lot of your patients move on to um, personal training, like wellness type programs? Just talk me through that a little bit. Yeah. So I will say that's awesome that you got to um, spend time at champion. One of our, one of my coworkers at true sports in the location that I'm in, uh, did a clinical with champion. His name is Brian Hunter and he speaks so highly, you know, of his experience there too. So I will say we are definitely much more, um, on the clinical rehab side in the sense of most of our locations don't offer strength and conditioning services by true sports. Um, there are a few that have a coach in house that work a little bit more intimately with the rehab team, but the way that we're set up is all true sports locations. So, as we're recording this, there's 12 or 13 of them uh, throughout Maryland and in Pennsylvania as well. All of the clinics are set up inside of a gym. So when I go to work, I don't walk into a building that is solely true sports. I walk into a gym um, that offers CrossFit and functional fitness classes. And then true sports is kind of set up in the back and we share the space. So I will say we we wear both hats. Um, We are, you know, doing physical therapy, we're billing insurance for rehab services. However, we have the space, we have the equipment necessary to truly bridge that gap. So there are quite a few patients who get to the point in their rehab, where if you were to watch them, you think that they're working with a trainer rather than a PT. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, So True Sports is very specific about hiring individuals who have strength and conditioning backgrounds so that we can provide both of those services under the sports PT umbrella. 
Okay. That's awesome. Um, so I guess, how do you position yourself to get a job like that? Is it something where you, you know, have to get your CSCS or what would some tips that you have be for someone looking to get into the space or land that job in sports like you did right after graduation? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So getting some of the feedback that I got from places that I interviewed at, um, I definitely think that having the CSCS certification is at the very least an attention grabber. You know, when an employer sees that or whoever's doing the the screening of resumes and such, if they're in the sports field, they're going to recognize that they're going to say, OK, this person at least went out of their way to obtain some knowledge in this thing. However, I don't believe it's necessary. And I do think that if you're going to get that certification, you've got to also go and get coaching training experience. Um like having skin in the game. And just like with physical therapy, you can memorize an entire textbook and know all of the numbers and the physiology and motor unit recruitment and all of this jazz. But if you haven't actually coached a human and given cues and seen cues that work and don't work and seen a person max out on the left, like all of these principles, you have to do them. Um, So I would say like, if you're interested, yeah, go and get the cert, but then find a way to also get the experience. So when I was an undergrad, I did an internship at a sports performance gym in Scranton, uh, you know, got credit and stuff for it academically. That ended up turning into a part-time job that I had for a little while through the start of PT school. And then during graduate school, I also worked as a strength and conditioning coach for a few of the varsity teams on campus. So I got to coach the field hockey team, which was super cool for me being an alumni, um, as well as some others. So when I interviewed with True Sports and I was able to say, yes, I have been with an athlete. I've seen them fail. I've corrected technique. Um, Like those are the things I think that are most important. And then just having a bit of a presence. Um, Social media, I guess it's not a requirement, But the fact that I had an Instagram up and running that at least showed some of my interests, it showed that I'm a fitness enthusiast. Um, It shows that I I walk the walk and talk the talk a little bit. Not that I'm an expert, Mm -hmm. but that also definitely helped just with them seeing that I authentically love this shit for the lack of a better way of saying it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, I really really like that last point you made, Um, just kind of sharing your experience as you go, I think is very important rather than proclaiming yourself to be the expert. Um, And that's interesting that you mentioned, you know, having social media may actually be helpful in getting a position like this. Um, One of my mentors kind of told me his approach to social media. And that is, if nothing else, you're just posting content so that if someone were to Google you, or look you up on social media, come across your name, they at least have a little bit of an idea of, you know, what are you about? What sorts of things? Um, what sorts of things do you believe in? How are you training people? Um, different things like that. So I think that's cool as well. Um, the next question I want to ask is, so like, what's your day-to-day caseload look like? Is it is everyone you treat an athlete? I know you mentioned you're trying to get more active adults into the clinic. So is it mostly, you know, youth that you're working with now or what's that kind of look like? Yeah, good question. So True Sports um, traditionally as a company is very much geared towards the team sport athlete we see high school, college, and professional athletes. Um, the CEO of True Sports, Yoni Rosenblatt is his name, treats a handful of Baltimore Ravens players as well as uh, some other NFL players. So in my day-to-day, I'm not treating these guys, but I'll be treating my athlete right next to a starting player on the Ravens, which is pretty cool. Um, so there is a really large continuum of athletes. For me personally, I do treat quite a few high school athletes typical sports injuries, ankle sprains, post-op knees, um, shoulder instability, you know, things like that. But um, I also treat a lot of active adults um, and CrossFit athletes. So we are inside of a gym that has a lot of CrossFitters, which is really cool. It's a population that I love treating. And a lot of those people, I'd say on average, are between the ages of like 25 and 50. So there's a pretty wide Mm -hmm. span there. And then the other, the other client that I'm getting a lot more of is the one who has been to physical therapy before and has just had the basic standard come in, 
get a hot pack, get a little massage, do the same exercises every single time by yourself and leave. And they've realized over that process, like, hey, this isn't really skilled. Like I'm I'm not working with somebody. Like, what am I getting from this? And then those people search online active physical therapy, athlete physical therapy, sports physical therapy. Um, and some of these individuals are in their 60s, but they are at a point in their life where they're like, hey, I want to get back into the gym or spin class or hiking or playing basketball in a pickup league. I want sports PT. Um, so my mission right now is to help spread the message that sports physical therapy is not just for quote unquote athletes. Anybody is an athlete if you want to be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely agree. Uh, last question I have about this transition period the job you're in now. So what tips would you have for a new grad looking to get into um, the field of like sports physical therapy. So what questions might they ask during the interview process to make sure it's a situation where they're truly going to be treating sports and it's not just like a quote unquote sports med clinic and they don't see, you know, much of that higher, um, higher activity population they're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Um, so not being afraid to ask is definitely a big thing. One thing that some mentors of mine also told me when I go on interviews is, um, to ask, you know, what is your caseload like? Can you show me some some diagnoses that you see? Um, and also offering to spend extra time and actually shadow and like see the day to day in the clinic. So, um, like let's say you have a thirty minute interview scheduled on the PT's lunch break. Say, hey, I would love to spend some extra time and get to know the patients and the other uh, therapists in the clinic. Can I hang out for a few hours after? First off, they're probably going to love that because it's like, oh, cool. Clearly you care and you're enthusiastic. And that's the first, that's the best way to see what they treat, right? So when I went on my first interview, it was with a company in Delaware um, who had, you know, marketed themselves as performance physical therapy. And I'm not in a position to define what that means, but I had in my head what that looks like. I want athletes. I want active adults. I want barbells. Um, I want turf. So I have a phone interview. It goes wonderfully. I go to the in-person interview, sat down with a woman, wonderful conversation, very interested. I hung out to see how, how they function, what their day-to-day -day is like. And without saying too much about it, I guess I was, I would just say I was underwhelmed. And it's not to say that I'm judging the person in the room. I treat plenty of people who are 50 years old with knee arthritis and are a little bit overweight and deconditioned. It's not the person it's what's the goal and what is the approach that we're taking to it. So when I then saw a PT have one hand on a patient and one hand on a laptop and this, this, all of the patients doing the same stretches, I just said, you know, this isn't for me. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I was really disappointed because I wanted that job. I wanted to live in that place. My boyfriend and I saw an apartment, like I had it all figured out. And that was also a big lesson for me of like, it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to pivot. And if it wasn't for that experience, I probably wouldn't have found True Sports over in Maryland. Um, so definitely just being open-minded and not being afraid to ask the questions because you owe it to yourself to interview the company as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah. And I think having like a clear set of criteria for what you want in a job is also important. Um, I imagine you kind of have that criteria for yourself and, you know, it didn't fit. So you moved on. So I think that's pretty admirable that, you know, you're able to recognize that. So cool. Um, so I want to pivot to kind of talk about our next topic, which is social media, starting your podcast, all that fun stuff. Um, so I was looking through your page this morning and so you began your social media journey back in 2019 you know, the podcast has been going for about a year and a half now. What were you thinking initially as you kind of made that first post on social media? Yeah, what was going I was through scared. Your mind? I was so scared for, for no good reason. Um, I've never been good at being vulnerable and that that's a big reason why I started my gratitude practice, which I know we'll get into, but my main reason for starting my page was my senior year of undergrad, uh, the year before I started physical therapy school, was when I really began to fall in love with physical therapy, human performance, fitness, 
And I had started following pages on Instagram. I remember the first PT I ever followed was Zach Long, the barbell physio. And I'm actually having him on my podcast this week. And it's it's such a full circle moment for me reflecting on that. Um, but I started following these pages and liking their posts. And I saw how how often these people would interact with people who commented or shared or whatnot. And I thought, okay, I want to talk to these people, but I don't want them following my personal page with pictures of me doing keg stands in college. <laughs> I want to create this other page that is just different. It, so I wasn't even thinking so much about, I want to post, I want to create. It was more so, I want to create a version of myself that is a little bit more professional um, and just more comfortable connecting with these people. So that's where it all started. And I I purposely made the page Goal Set Mindset Um because I didn't want to make it my name. Like I didn't want to call myself Julie Brill Fitness or whatever, because I only told like a few people when I made this account. And it's funny because now I would encourage everybody I know to make an Instagram account devoted to what your passion is. But I was just so afraid of judgment. And um, over time when people would follow it and say, oh, I, I think it's so cool that you're doing that. And once I followed other people who had a page devoted to fitness, it made me more comfortable. So yeah, my my mindset on it and outlook on it back then was very different than the outlook that I have now. Yeah, it's such it's such a bizarre thing to think about in retrospect, like the reason you got started versus where you are now. Um, cause I was kind of in the same spot. Initially I started my social media page is just like a way to separate myself a little bit and applying to residency programs. So like, okay, I'm going to post like these short tidbits on orthopedic content content. And the more I got involved with social media, I realized there's like a million pages doing similar things. It seemed like there's so many students like posting exercise videos and I'm like, all right. I don't necessarily think that this is the route I want to take. Like, how can I make myself different on social media? What can I get out of social media? Um, that's maybe not this, uh, the same thing that's occurring over and over again. Um, so that's just when I started talking to more physical therapists and reaching more for the connection aspect of social media, as opposed to like posting exercise and things like that. Um, yeah, I so, completely agree. Yeah. So just interesting. Um, so then at what point did you decide you wanted to actually make the podcast? Yeah, good question. I have been a lover of podcasts for probably like four years now. I think it was also around that senior year where I started to, um, develop as a coach and a lover of human physiology and human performance that mm -hmm. I just was diving deep as a consumer of podcasts and, there were certain ones that I really gravitated towards. And every time I would listen to a podcast that I loved, I just felt different. Like I just felt more excited. I felt inspired. And I started to realize how much podcasts had an effect on me. And then I began to tell myself, okay, one day I want to do this. Like I want to have a podcast one day. I want to inspire <laughs> others. I want to connect with others. And then I started the podcast back in the summer of 2021, and this is a very like distinct moment. I was driving home from uh, the end of my three-month clinical in Philadelphia, so I spent a summer in Philly working at Thomas Jefferson, my first rotation, acute care in a city I'd never been in, and I was driving home listening to one of my favorite podcasts, uh, which is the Muscle Intelligence Podcast by Ben Pakulski. He's a bodybuilder, fitness enthusiast, but talks a lot about um, a lot about mindset stuff and just about becoming your best self and living unapologetically. And I was listening to this one episode where he was just talking about like letting go of the shackles and like stop putting things off the only time that his promise is right now. And I was driving on, you know, the New Jersey Turnpike, wide open road, and I was just like, I'm going to do a podcast. Like I had this moment and I was driving to, to my boyfriend's apartment. And as soon as I got there, I was like, I have to say this out loud because it's not going to happen if I don't like, I want to have a podcast. It's going to be called the goal set mindset podcast. I'm going to talk about weekly wellness tips. And I, I just spilled it. 
And then he's like, great, when? And I was like, well, maybe next year, not yet. And then two days later, Giovanni, my boyfriend, hands me a Amazon box and says, open this. And I open it. And it was this blue Yeti microphone. And he said, now's the time. Like, you're ready. So definitely had a little bit of um, a lot of support to kind of get me started. But it was really, it was me being a consumer. It was me loving this shit. And it was me having that moment of just being like, okay, I'm ready and jumping in. Um, and my first episode was called Take the Leap because that's exactly what it felt like. I was like, I don't know where this is going. I don't know what people are going to think. I don't know if it's going to su- succeed or not, um, but let's go. And since then, I have released an episode every week for, I think this was episode 68 last week. So nice. yeah, it's been an awesome journey. So what's been your secret to the consistency then? So if you said like every single week, um, is it just holding yourself accountable and making a time slot or what have been some things that have helped you be successful? Yeah. Um, so my podcast is a little bit of a blend of solo episodes and guest episodes. When I first got started, it was just me and the microphone, 15, 20 minute talk on something that I wanted to talk about, fitness, wellness, mindset, whatever. Um, and then as I started to have guests on, I created this rhythm of alternating every Monday. It would be either a longer guest interview or a, uh, a shorter episode by me about something in this moment that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about. So with the guest interviews, cause you know, it's challenging to, to find a time and to reach out to the person yep. and to hear back from them. So I really have leveraged periods of my life where I've had more time to kind of batch episodes. So over the summer when I was studying for boards, I really wasn't doing a whole lot else. So I recorded probably like eight or nine episodes in the month of July, some of which just came out like one or two weeks ago. So that's one tip I would have um, is when you have, if you have like a week where you're like, oh, cool, I've got time here. Let me reach out to a few people and see what we can do. And then My other thing that is a tip that I'm getting better at is not striving for perfection. In the beginning, when I started making podcasts, I would sit for hours and record and delete and record and delete and record and be like, oh, why did I say that? Delete. And I've now given myself some grace of like, podcasts are supposed to sound like a conversation. You know, it's supposed to flow. And and the little um, slip ups here and there is something that you learn from. So now, especially when I record my solo episodes, I'll be doing one later about um, what lights your soul on fire. Just this idea that I had when I was walking yesterday. And more than likely, I'm going to sit down and press record and just talk. And I've realized that those are the episodes that people respond best to because Mm -hmm. authenticity attracts authenticity and people can see that. So that's my other tip is just like, not everything has to be perfect. Like you said, with the Instagram, put out the content and I'm sure it'll resonate with somebody along the way. Okay. I would say that's extremely relatable. There's been periods of time where I've had like three or four posts just saved on my phone. It's like, okay, why don't you post that? And then same thing too. I've record. I think I recorded an episode um, about my cycling accident and kind of the rehab process. I think I recorded it three or four times before I was comfortable releasing it. So it's Exactly like you said, sometimes the best uh, episodes are those one take where you just lay it all on the line. They're very authentic. So I like that message a lot. Um, <clears throat> so what would you say what would you say some of the biggest challenges are for you right now with social media? Yeah. So one of the things for me right now, and when I say social media, Instagram is where I spend pretty much all of my social media time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm kind of addicted to it. I am just mindlessly scrolling so much and I get so upset with myself when I'm like sitting on the couch or just like standing in my kitchen. Like I walk over to my phone to send a text to my mom. And then before I know it, 15 minutes have passed and I'm on Instagram looking at people's posts that I don't even know or just don't need in this moment. And it's been, um, something that I'm realizing more lately, which I'm glad that I'm bringing some self-awareness about it, 
but really just navigating like how do I set boundaries around when am I going to create when am I going to consume and just like with the podcast um being okay with things not being perfect not going too hard with the editing and overthinking the caption because at the end of the day like how many people are actually going to sit down and read your super well thought out caption Mm -hmm. so not putting too much energy into things that just probably don't need that much energy I guess is something that I'm learning um but one thing that it's it's been has been really helpful for me is like we talked about not being afraid to reach out and connect with people like just before we recorded I posted a reel um of just something that's on my mind, a a quote about my walk yesterday. And I decided to tag a bunch of people in my life who have helped me feel more present lately. Some of these Mm -hmm. people are my best friends. And some of these people are people that I communicate with through Instagram. And I was for a moment, I'm like, oh, is it weird if I tag them? Are they going to be like, why is Julie tagging me? And then I let go of that. And I'm just like, you know what, I want this person to know that I I'm grateful for them, that they're helping me, that they're encouraging me. What do I have to lose? So again, letting go of the shackles of like, what are other people going to think? And just, just doing what feels right, you know? Yeah. And I think if you've got good intent with the content you're putting out, like post and forget and be comfortable with, you know, whatever happens at the end of the day, it's just a post. So exactly. Very, very interesting to think about. Cause I think oftentimes, you know, we get so wrapped up in the moment of, I don't want to say I'm a content creator because I don't feel like I am one, Uh, but so wrapped up with the content we're posting, making sure it's perfect, making sure, you know, people are going to respond positively to it. Um, When in reality, it's a lot more just about sharing the journey, sharing what you're experiencing, and maybe other people gravitate towards you and be interested. So very cool. Um, What would you say, I mean, do you have any advice to, you know, students looking to get started with social media or clinicians looking to get started with social media? Is it something they should do? Is it oversaturated? What's kind of your uh, opinion on the state of social media for PTs? Yes, I think, yes, take the leap, make that Instagram first name, last name, SPT, like whatever you want to call yourself um, and just start connecting with people that you resonate with because physical therapy as a profession is riddled with burnout, right? Like people talk about it all the time. When you're in PT school, you might have guest lecturers come and talk about student debt and just how overworked our profession is and all of these like negative things, which reality is reality. And those are important conversations to have, but it's really easy to get in this negative mindset about a career that is so amazing and impactful and community oriented. And some professions you know, LinkedIn is like the main way of connecting and sharing. Physical therapy just isn't that way. We live on the gram. So if you want to connect with other PTs and coaches and, you know, like for me, once I got into the later stage of my undergrad, I realized that I was like kind of a nerd. Um, I was the kid who was staying after class to talk to my professor and again, was always worried about what other people would think. Oh, do they think I'm a kiss ass? Like, and it was never like that, but in my head it was. And with Instagram, it's like, if you feel called, if you feel excited by learning about um, growing muscle or learning about neuro or helping people in the hospital, like all of these things, there's somebody on Instagram, probably multiple people on Instagram talking about that thing. So it's, it doesn't need to be so much about what you post and what you contribute, but use it as a way to connect with those people. And then when it comes to posting, I learned this advice from uh, Mike Reinold and his podcast. And I heard this years ago, but they talked about this idea of like, how can students have a presence on social media? And they talked about like, don't try to outsmart everybody. Like don't feel the need to make like this long lengthy educational post of course we can make educational posts because we know a lot about health and wellness and whatnot. Um, but it doesn't need to be super sciencey, like post about what you're learning. Um, don't talk in absolutes. Don't be like, this is the best exercise for patellar tendonitis because nobody knows what that is. So like, don't be that student who's trying to overdo it. And, and, um, don't feel like you have to explain yourself. Like, 
just, just show your journey, you know, post about what you're excited about, post about your personal fitness journey. Um, stuff like that, I think is where, you know, it's a good place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then I think I'm ready to kind of pivot to our last topic, which is, I think the one everyone's been waiting for your gratitude journey. (laughs) Um, so I'm just going to preface this by saying, I think a lot of people struggle with gratitude. I know everyone wants to, you know, get in a routine where maybe they're listing a couple things they're grateful for every day. Um, I've done this in the past too. And I feel like I usually get to, you know, 28, 30 days, get in that range. And for whatever reason, I start to trickle off. Um, I think the farthest I've gotten so far is 77 days. Um, but now I'm kind of in a period where I'm not, I'm not practicing every day and I don't know why. Um, so maybe just kind of take us back to when this whole gratitude journey started. Yeah. Well, first off, I will say 77 days is still very impressive. And just like any habit in life and anything in life that's good for you, consistency is more important than perfection. Um, I have this long streak and we'll get into it a little bit and and why it is the way that it is. But I'm the first person to tell everybody like, hey, it doesn't have to be every day. Maybe it's on the days that you're feeling really good that you sit down and write down all of those things that make you feel good. Or maybe it's on the days that you feel really crappy and you want to shed some light on on the things you're grateful for. So it doesn't need to be perfect. So give yourself some grace too. You are a very busy man. Um, but to talk about my journey a little bit. So I uh, had heard a lot about gratitude in the, pra- in the past. I mentioned a few times on this conversation that I love human performance and the human body and really interested in psychology. And this idea that gratitude is so heavily studied in terms of mental performance um, really kind of caught my eye. And in May of 2020, um, I was going through some hard stuff. You know, of course, COVID had just started and was kind of uplifting some some parts of our life um, or uprooting, I should say, not uplifting. And I was living with my dad um, towards the end of May into June because he was going through some pretty significant health problems. And there was a lot of unknowns. There was a lot of like, is my dad going to wake up tomorrow and be okay? And I was reading a book at the time. Um, It was Brene Brown's book about leadership, but it just kind of made me dive into personal growth. And I was like, you know what? Let me give this gratitude thing a try. I'm going to go to Target because what else do you do during COVID? You go to stores that are open and walk around. I'm going to go to Target and I'm going to find a notebook and I'm going to try to do it for 30 days. And I actually have my initial notebook right behind me. These are my first two gratitude books this is the little notebook I bought it's literally the size of my hand Um, wow nice and I decided five things I'm grateful for every morning from the last 24 hours so I learned this from Rachel Hollis she's a a speaker and author um, female entrepreneur and she spoke about the importance of when you're practicing gratitude limiting it to that window of the previous day or the current day, because if you don't, it's easy to just monotonously write like my family, my house, a roof over my head. Of course, we should feel grateful for those things, but intimately connecting with the things that are happening in the here and now is really where the magic happens and where the challenge lies. Um, So yeah, so I started practicing this gratitude at honestly one of the hardest points in my life and at this point on Instagram, I had like, I don't know, a hundred followers and I just was doing it for accountability. It's like, this will be fun. Let's get to 30 days, got to 30 days and said, okay, let's get to a hundred days. And by that time it became a thing that I do, a thing that I love doing, a thing that made other people smile and react and say, oh, I'm so happy. I made your gratitude list today. Um, and here we are at day 930 and still going. So it's, it's, uh, it's been really cool. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that hard season of life because I would not have started without it. Okay. Uh, do you feel like there's a lot of repeat items that end up on the list or do you try and be unique every single day? I think that that, that's maybe one of the reasons why I backed off a little bit. I felt like I was saying, 
you know, some of the same things over and over again, um, which is great that I'm grateful for them, but I felt like, you know, maybe this yeah. list needs to be more unique every day. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's definitely things like, um, one of the things that brings me so much joy is getting sunlight in the morning and going for a quick walk. And I've probably written about morning sunlight or a morning walk in some capacity multiple times. So yeah, like there's going to be some repeat things, but taking a unique approach to it of like, what is it about the sun on that day? Like, was it the sun on a really cold day where the rest of your body is cold and you feel that sun on your face? Like that brings me joy. Or was it um, walking past the barbershop on my street and like saying, hey, to the guys inside and we don't know each other, but I walk by every morning. So they're like, hey, that part of my walk, I, I'm grateful for. Like really narrowing in on these like oddly specific moments that sometimes are laughable because they're so specific, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and then the challenging thing about sharing it, I mean, I love sharing it because I am very, um, uncomfortable with vulnerability. Traditionally, I'm getting better at it, but it's really opened myself up to sharing these, these more private moments of my life. And of course I can't post everything on there, you know, specific interactions that I have with patients or, my family or my boyfriend, like I'm not going to write everything on there. But mm -hmm. when I sit down to practice gratitude, there's typically more than five thoughts that come to mind. And then it's just a matter of like, what are the five that are going to make the list today? Um, but I've been surprised by how many people over the last two and a half years have responded either saying, oh, I'm so glad I made it. Like, thank you. I also had a great time getting coffee yesterday or um, people in my work environment, like a few women in the CrossFit gym that I work inside of have approached me and are like, Hey, Julie, I just bought a journal. I, I saw your story. Um, I'm going to start doing it. And they've never sent me a message. They've never responded with a heart emoji, but, but they told me mm -hmm. that they bought one. And that also makes me wonder like, huh, I wonder if there's anybody else out there who hasn't outright said that I've inspired them who also felt a little bit inspired at one point in their life to give this a try. Um, and that, you know, makes me feel good. Yeah. I feel like you should brand a challenge or something. Cause it's like, I see that every single day and I'm like, dang, she's, she's still going. Um, and it, it's kind of a point for me to stop and think to myself too, like, okay, she's taking time to be grateful. I'm seeing this. Um, you know, maybe I need to take a second for myself and at least think about a couple of things. So you're doing great work there. What what differences have you seen in your life since you started practicing gratitude? Like what changes have you noticed? Yeah, great question. So definitely helping me live more in the present moment. Um, I think a lot of us as human beings, it's it's a survival mechanism where we think about the past and we think about the bad things that have happened to us in the past or the things that have shaped us. And we also spend a lot of time thinking about the future and like, okay, how am I working towards this goal and having anxiety about things that might happen that haven't happened. And I was really in that, in that place when I started my practice where I just was having so much trouble seeing the good around me. So practicing this daily has definitely changed my brain chemistry and my brain's ability to see and pick out these little things in my day. Um, one way that I describe it is like, as humans, again, survival mechanism, um, we naturally are going to see the negatives so much easier than the positive. Because when we go back to thousands of years ago, it was a lot more important to notice the saber toothed tiger than to notice like the pretty flowers next to you. But now in this day and age, we still have the same brain. We still seek danger. We look for danger. We try to find it in our environment. The unfortunate thing is that danger now isn't the same danger as it was, yet our body responds the same. So going through Instagram and being worried about how many likes that you get might trigger that same survival mechanism because you're like, oh my God, social acceptance. And like, that's just how our brains are wired. But think about how silly that is. So doing this has definitely helped when I'm walking on my morning walk instead of just like 
listening to a podcast or I don't know, being zoned into negative things that I'm worried about. I noticed the dude inside the barbershop, like throwing up a peace sign and saying good morning to me. And I never, I never used to see those little moments, those little miracles that happen around us um, that really connect us as human beings. And the other thing I'll say, John, is it's, it's helped me open up to others. And it's taught me that gratitude should not be kept inside of us. Gratitude is most powerful when it's shared. And there's science behind this too. When they've looked at studies of brain mapping, when somebody is um, expressing gratitude, there's differences between when you're just thinking about it versus when you're actually telling somebody like, hey, I'm really grateful that you invited me on this podcast today. Like this means a lot to me. Different things happen. So I remember that. And I see in my day to day, like in healthcare, it's so easy to feel separated by this like weird, like patient to practitioner relationship of like, I have the white coat and like, you're in need. It's like, let's just connect. And, and me saying to my patient, like, Hey, I'm so happy that you're here working with me. Like, thank you for coming in or, you know, thank you for that feedback you gave me, or thank you for texting me and letting me know that you felt good. Like, it's just going to bring us closer as humans. Um, And a lot of us feel weird about getting emotional with people, especially in the clinic. And gratitude is an emotion that is powerful and contagious and necessary in the world we live in. I like it a lot. Oops. It sounds like an overall just greater awareness throughout life too has been something that's been a big adjustment. So you're a perfect example of the wonders that you know gratitude can have. Um, so that's awesome. I won't take too much more of your time. Uh, I do have five questions that I ask all my guests uh, who come on the show. Are you up for it? Yeah, let's do it. All right. First question is, what's your biggest key to a successful day? And I am uh, very type A, so there's a lot of things that I want to see in my day for it to be successful. But something I've been focusing on lately is, was there at least one person that I interacted with that I left better than I found them? And by that, I mean, not that I'm like changing their life in this magical way, but do they feel better about themselves because they interacted with me? So if I know whether that's a patient whether that's a stranger at my gym that I say, Hey, your squats looked awesome today. And they're like, Ooh, cool. Thanks. Um, like being weird like that and just complimenting people and telling them they look awesome. Uh, that makes me know that, that my day was successful. All right. Question number two, um, what do you wish someone would have told you five years ago today that would impact what you're doing now? Yeah. So I was a much different human five years ago. I was a junior in college. Um, and I wish that somebody told me to stop hiding my passion. I have always been a loud, excited, larger than life kind of girl. And I've hid it away because I've wanted to fit in. Um, I've been told that I'm loud. And because of that, when I started getting really excited about things in life, as I grew into becoming a professional, um, I was kind of embarrassed to show it. And I wish that somebody told me that passion is something that should be celebrated, that this world needs more of. Um, and it is something that I'm embracing now, but I struggled with that a lot back then. And, and I wish somebody had told me that. Yeah. I think part of that's just kind of getting older and growing into yourself too, uh, recognizing what your strengths are and you're taking advantage of them now. So uh, next question, what book or product has impacted you the most over the last three months? Yeah, so I read this book um, over three months ago. It was probably over a year ago, but its impact on me has been most clear over the last few months. And this book is Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. I think that the the message in this book is really important to working as a clinician, um, as a coach, somebody who works in the industry of human beings, because approaching a situation with humility is really where people are going to feel comfortable. And I realize like how much we are ego driven. And especially in PT, it's like, if a patient doesn't get better, 
it's like a hit to our ego and we internalize so many things. So this book has taught me to approach every situation with how can I benefit this person, this place, this thing, rather than asking the question of like, how can this person place or thing benefit me? Instead, Mm -hmm. how can I benefit that thing? So yeah, Ego is the Enemy was a really good one. I'm halfway through the audio book right now. I can definitely recommend it as well. Um, Next question, what's a quote you live by or one that's drastically impacted your life? This is one I found recently on Instagram and I shared it on a podcast that I did a few weeks, a few weeks ago. It reads friendly reminder that you have zero control over how other people perceive you. So you might as well just be the person you want to be anyway. Nice. I like it. Uh, last question I have for you. Signature question, of the podcast, Drew Brill, what is your favorite snack? My favorite snack is chips and salsa. Like if you put a bowl of like salty tortilla chips and some nice mild medium salsa, game over. I will eat the entire bag by myself. No chance. I'm just amazed we still have not had a single repeat snack. So thank you for continuing to be unique. And thanks for coming on the show. You offered a lot of great insight. um, And I I appreciate the thoughtfulness and approach you take to life. I think my listeners are really going to enjoy you know, hearing your story and hearing um, some of the awesome stuff you're doing. So where can my listeners find you? If you want to plug anything right now, go right ahead. Yeah. Awesome. John, thank you so much for having me. This was a really fun conversation, especially like you said, with somebody who's going through some similar stuff in life. So thanks for having me. Um, Best way to find out about me and reach out to me is on Instagram. I am at goal set mindset underscore JB, or you can search my name, Julie Burrell. Um, and I would also love if anybody wanted to check out my podcast, we are the goal set mindset podcast on all platforms, love to connect with people as we talked about today. Um, so really excited to have been here, John, and excited to connect with some of your listeners. All right. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a great week and we'll see you on the next one.